scoliosis surgery has really evolved quite a bit um, in the last half century, and it's remarkable. Uh, in the 1950s, if you had scoliosis, you went to the hospital uh, as an adolescent, and you had an operation, and they put you in a body cast, and they left you in bed. And you stayed in bed for six months, at which point they made a window into the cast. They cut a, a hole in the cast. They reopened the spinal wound. They put new bone graft in. They put the cast back on and left you in bed. So if you had scoliosis as an adolescent in 1950, you spent a year in the hospital. And then in the 1960s, uh, Paul Harrington invented what most people recognize as Harrington rods, which was a system to fix the spine internally. So now we had uh, metal rods and hooks that we could attach to the spine that would control the scoliosis. And this was, you know, just a dramatic change in the way we treated adolescents. So now you went from a year in the hospital in a, in a body cast to wearing, having a surgery, being discharged from the hospital within a couple of weeks uh, in a brace. Uh, and we wore the brace for maybe three to six months. Uh, and it was ambulatory. You didn't have to stay in bed. And that was really improved uh, things even more. Uh, so now scoliosis became really something that you could do uh, for more people because it was just more practical. Uh, and it was very safe, proved to be very safe. Um, and so we really thought, you know, that was really a big thing. And that really, and, and that stuff that Harrington developed in the early 1960s really held up well into the 1980s. I mean, it's amazing to think that it was 20 years that this surgeon from Texas developed a system that held up for, for that length of time. And it's the same time during orthopedics where we were developing all, all much of the other instrumentation that we use now, total hip replacement, total knee replacement, internal fixation of fractures. This all was occurring during the late 60s and 70s. So he was right in that era where orthopedics really changed from uh, a discipline where we treated people who were paralyzed with strokes or polio uh, to, and had deformities of their feet to something where you could treat people who had problems that affected their daily life, that they could really inc improve their quality of life in an, in an amazing way. And, and there were shortfalls to the Harrington system, no doubt. Um, the rate of fusion was not 100%, and you still had to wear a brace for three to six months. So people were looking to improve that. And so in the mid-1970s, uh, many surgeons began to look for alternatives, and we began to use um, more fixation in the spine. So the Harrington system, you had a hook at the top and a hook at the bottom, and it was literally a ratchet system. So you just stretched the spine out and you kept stretching until you got to the point where you kind of reached the maximal correction, and that was it. Um, in the 1970, late 1970s, early 1980s, people began to use wires in the spine, and what they'd do is they'd make a small frame uh, in the spine, and then they'd put wires through each vertebra and pull the spine to the frame to make it straight. And that's called, that was termed second generation technique. The person whose name is most uh, associated with that is Eduardo Luque, who was a surgeon in Mexico City, uh, who developed the Luque system. And that was, and that, so about, for about 10 years, um, Luque instrumentation was the kind of de facto uh, instrumentation that people moved to. The problem with Luque instrumentation is because you had to stick wires into the spinal canal itself. You have to pass the wires into the spinal canal. The rate of neurologic problems was higher. So people were, you know, you're taking a kid who's neurologically intact, who has a spinal deformity, but not necessarily a dangerous problem, and now you're subjecting them to a surgery that potentially could cause paralysis. So people tried to get away from that. In the mid-1980s was really the, the big revolution, uh, and uh, it really, and it started in France. Uh, there were a surgeon named uh, Yves Cottrell and John Dubesset. Uh, came up with what we call what was known as CD or Cottrell Dubesset instrumentation, and the real um, real revolution there was that now we could use multiple hooks or mul or screws at multiple places along the rod, so it wasn't just at the ends, but it was all through the middle to control the the, the spine in space. Uh, and everything we do now today is really an outgrowth of CD instrumentation. Uh, so that that was and that was about 1985. Um, so now. Uh, most surgeons are using primarily screws in the bones, but everything we do is really an outgrowth of that concept of you can fix multiple vertebra along a rod with different anchor points to control the spine in space. And of course, the great, the great um, advantage of, of, of that type of instrumentation is you don't need a brace, right? After surgery, uh, you don't need a brace. 
and you know, and the fusion rates are very, very high. They're almost 100%. And we have a better ability to control the position of the spine in space. So one of the problems with Harrington instrumentation was that because it was only, the ability to, was only to stretch the spine, so we took a C, what we thought was a C-shaped curve and we stretched it, so we made it straight by making it longer. And that works if you're looking at somebody from the front. But what we've realized as time has gone on is that the sagittal or the sideways profile of the spine is really more important for the spine's function. So the spine has reciprocal curves. Your low back has a curve to the front, your thoracic spine has a curve to the back, and you make like a big S. Um, and it's really the way that S balances itself out affects how we function in terms of our spine function. Um, and Harrington instrumentation flattened that, that S because you're stretching everything out, made the spine very flat. Uh, and that, in the long run, when people got older, didn't function very well. So what you have is these, these adolescent kids who have scoliosis surgery, and after surgery, they're straighter, they're a little taller, um, but they don't, and they can compensate for the flattening of their spine because the, the bottom of their spine is so very healthy that it can actually go where it needs to go to make them stand up straight. As we get older, we lose the flexibility of our low spine and the discs wear out and collapse a little bit. And then people end up with this postural problem where they can't stand up straight because their low spine can no longer compensate for the flattening that's occurred. And so, we end up having to go back and redo their surgery because we need to make we need to help them stand up. So Harrington worked great for adolescents. It didn't work so very well for adults. Um, and it, and the long term effect of having your spine fused in that position was not as nice or as good as we would have hoped. So that so now that we have this third generation technique, you can build those curves back into the spine because we fix the spine all along its all along the spine so that now you can build the curve into the spine the way, you not, way you'd like it. And so that even later on, if there's some degeneration, you've kind of got the spine in a better position so it doesn't have to, so you can compensate for that very well. So for lots of reasons, the third generation technique that we use now is advantageous that most kids are in the hospital for three to four days after surgery. They go home, uh, they don't have to wear a brace or a cast. By the time they come back to the office at their six weeks office visit, it's like they've never even had an operation. Um, and by three months, I let them return to sports play um, and they get on with the rest of their life and, and most of the results are really very excellent. So, you know, you go back from a year in bed, <laughs> in a cast, away from your family, to three or four days in the hospital and three months later, you're back to you know, all your normal activities uh, with a good long-term prognosis as an adult. And, it's really a remarkable change that we've been able to see just in a couple of years. Um, it, it's, you know, the, the third generation technique is so powerful that it allows us to do surgery on people we weren't even able to contemplate doing surgery on many years ago. So now it's opened up this entire concept of doing scoliosis surgery in adults. So we have lots of adults who have painful scoliosis. Either they had scoliosis as an adolescent, and their curve has now gotten worse as they've aged, or they didn't have scoliosis at Nelson, but they've developed it in adulthood, but they have this terrible incapacitating pain related to the fact that they now have developed a spinal deformity or their spinal deformity has worsened. Uh, and we can address this surgically very successfully. Uh, we understand the mechanics of the way the spine needs to work in a way we didn't. 20 or 30 years ago. We have instrumentation that allows us to fix the spine in a way we didn't 20 or 30 years ago. Um, we, un we have techniques to get bone to fuse. You know, one of the big problems in adult scoliosis is that adults don't grow bone like kids do. You know, you're an adolescent, you're gonna make bone to beat the band. So we can uh, put some bone graft in there and we're pretty sure it's gonna fuse. When you're a 50 year old postmenopausal female, uh, you may not be a great bone former. So we have to go a little further to help to make biology work for us. But we've developed a whole series of techniques and we understand the technical aspects of getting bone to form in that adult patient. So now we have the tools to put the spine where we want to. We understand where the spine needs to be in order to get good function. And we have the biology to make it work so that, you know, it's this big, it's this triple, triple uh, 
attack that we can employ to have a successful undertaking to deal with adult scoliosis.